Hello residents, this video is on the cabinet itself, Rolling Thunder. Underneath the emergency drugs, you'll find devices that will help you manage airways. This course is part of our IV moderate sedation course for dentists that we teach at the foundry. This video is intended to go along with that. I'm Mike McCracken. The course is taught by Drs. Rosensteel and Caputo. So we've talked about the kit and the card over, overview. This is the the elements inside of the card itself, the um, predominantly things that we're going to use to manage the airway, but also emergency IV access. Here's your uh, oral pharyngeal airways, your nasal pharyngeal airways. We'll be focusing on those out of the top kit. In the second drawer, we're going to talk about the eye gel. Grab the green one, eye gel uh, device, LMA, pharyngeal mask. And then in the bottom drawer, we'll talk about the uh, quick trach and the endotracheal tube. So different kinds of airways, the airway adjuncts, the advanced airways, and the easy IO intraosseous uh, access, which we usually put into the tibia. The oral pharyngeal airway, or OPA, they generally, they, some of them are tube shaped. Some of them are like this, which is flat with channels in the side to allow air to pass, but they all have that curved appearance to them. The basic premise is that if the tongue is in the way, the patient's either unconscious or semi-conscious, they're not able to maintain their own airway. The tongue keeps falling back onto the epiglottis. You can insert one of these. It will cause your patient to gag. You can't put this into a, a conscious patient uh, but you wouldn't need to, right, if they're conscious. So you would, in general, you put it in with the tip up, slide it in, flip it around, and uh, retract the tongue with that. Then once that's in place, you can uh, bag the patient easily over that if you need to. The device is sized by putting it onto the angle of the mandible and, and sizing one that goes from roughly the incisors to the angle of the mandible. Here's a a video on that to explain this. Honestly, for most of this uh, teaching video that I did today, I just pulled stuff off YouTube. Okay, so we're going to have a look at oropharyngeal airway insertion. First thing we need to do is size up the OPA. To do that, we're going to look at the angle of the patient's jaw. So we're going to place the end of the OPA against the angle of the patient's jaw and have a look at the angle across where the patient's incisors are. So we're going for the level of the patient's incisors, which looks to be around about the right level for this size OPA and this patient. We then need to have a think about inserting the OPA. So to do that, we're going to invert it. So essentially turn it upside down and insert it into the patient's mouth against their hard palate, rotate it around, and then locate it into the airway, nicely into the oropharynx. So we're gonna invert, insert, rotate, and locate and that should give us a nice secure airway all the way through without the tongue flopping back against the soft palate at the back of the mouth all right the nasal pharyngeal airway or the NPA is a device that you insert through the nose it's a little tube some people call it a nasal trumpet this I could imagine actually using during a moderate sedation if you need an oral airway your patients either way too deeply sedated or something not going well, but I've thought about using nasopharyngeal airway once or twice. I have uh, attempted one once. It was hurting the patient. I should have numbed him up. So a couple things learned. You uh, lubricate the device, insert it through the nose. It does not necessarily cause a gag reflex. In the literature, this improves sleep apnea. And so if you have a patient that's apneic and you, you uh, might be able to, depending on the patient, you might be able to insert a nasal trumpet and uh, get better flow so they're not uh, you know, going into apnea all the time, and driving your O2 sats down, interrupting your surgery. So if I were doing this tomorrow, I would use a, uh, a lidocaine spray of uh, or some kind of topical anesthetic to numb the nasal mucosa. I would size this uh, by, by length from the nostril to the earlobe by diameter, just something smaller than the, than the uh, 
uh, opening in the nose, which is generally the size of the patient's uh, pinky or simply one that will fit. I've got a, a video coming up of a, of a, of a guy doing the man hacks. I don't know this, uh, uh, group, but, uh, this person is, is doing one on himself to give you a little demonstration. So I think this will be a good resident activity. This is my first time. I'm glad that we're friends and I'm on the good side. Let's go in and I'm gonna rotate it down. That's a little more uh, academic, I suppose. Here we have a, a, a group uh, that we just saw a second ago. A little more information. Let's have a look at MPA insertion then. First thing we need to do is prepare our equipment. So here we have a nasopharyngeal airway looking at size around about a size seven. We've got a relatively average sized male patient on this occasion. And we, for that, you're looking around about a size seven would be ideal. For an average size female, you may be looking at a, at a size six, but it's always gonna be dependent on the size of the patient's nares and on the general size of the anatomy that you're dealing with. We've applied some lubricant to this NPA, so it should be ready to go in. When you are applying lubricant, just be aware that you don't want it to go past the end of the open ends of the airway so that you're not obscuring the airway in any way at all. This particular airway comes with a washer as you can see on the end there and um, that's to prevent it accidentally going too far into the patient's nostrils. Some airways you may come across may have a safety pin as well but they're to clip into the airway itself rather than clipping to any part of the patient. We're going to insert the MPA with the bevel which is on the end here, we're going to face that towards the patient's septum. So in this case, if we go into the right nostril, facing the bevel towards the septum, and we're essentially just going to push it vertically down into the patient's airway, allowing it to follow the anatomical curve of the airway round to fit, end up at the bottom of the nasopharynx. You can insert it into either nostril, and it's normally going to be into whichever nostril happens to be largest. Next concept for us is the advanced airway laryngeal mask, and this is called the eye gel. I have not used one of these. I intend to use one when we can get uh, Dr. Caputo in in place and uh, uh, doing some general anesthesia in the clinic. I, uh, I could imagine using it. Like, I don't imagine intubating a patient in an emergency situation myself, never having done it before on a live patient, but I could imagine doing one of these it looks simple, it looks intuitive, and so here's a video uh, describing this device and how to use it. Eye gel is supplied in a sterile pouch enclosed in either a protective cradle or a cage pack. This innovative packaging is color-coded for size and designed to ensure the device is maintained in the correct flexion prior to use. It also acts as a base for lubrication. Select the appropriate size eye gel according to patient weight. When selecting size, it should be remembered that the eye gel cuff does look smaller than the corresponding size of many traditional supraglottic airways with an inflatable cuff. Ensuring that you conform to local policy for hygiene, open the eye gel package and on a flat surface take out the protective cradle or cage pack containing the device. In the final minute of pre-oxygenation, remove the eye gel and place a small bolus of a water-based lubricant such as KY jelly onto the middle of the smooth surface of the cradle or cage pack in preparation for lubrication. Do not use silicon-based lubricants. 
Grasp the eye gel with the opposite free hand along the integral bite block and lubricate the back, sides and front of the cuff with a thin layer of lubricant. This process may be repeated if lubrication is not adequate. After lubrication has been completed, check that no bolus of lubricant remains in the bowl of the cuff or elsewhere on the device. Avoid touching the cuff of the device with your hands. Place the eye gel back into the protective cradle or cage pack in preparation for insertion. Do not place the device onto the pillow or chest of the patient. Always use the protective cradle or cage pack. Do not use unsterile gauze to help in lubricating the device. Do not apply lubricant too long before insertion. And always ensure dentures or plates are removed from the mouth before attempting insertion. The eye gel must always be separated from the protective cradle or cage pack prior to use. These are not introducers and must never be inserted into the patient's mouth. Insertion technique. A proficient user can achieve insertion in less than five seconds. Remove the eye gel from the protective cradle or cage pack. Grasp the lubricated eye gel firmly along the integral bite block. Position the device so that the eye gel cuff outlet is facing towards the chin of the patient. The patient should be in the sniffing the morning air position, with head extended and neck flexed. The chin should be gently pressed down before proceeding to insert. Introduce the leading soft tip into the mouth of the patient in a direction towards the hard palate. Glide the device downwards and backwards along the hard palate with a continuous but gentle push until a definitive resistance is felt. Do not apply excessive force on the device during insertion. It is not necessary to insert fingers or thumbs into the patient's mouth during the process of insertion. If there is early resistance during insertion, a jaw thrust or insertion with deep rotation is recommended. When inserted to a definitive resistance, the tip of the eye gel should be located into the upper esophageal opening and the cuff should be located against the laryngeal framework. The incisors should be resting on the integral bite block. The eye gel has a horizontal line on the integral bite block to indicate the optimal position of the teeth. But the teeth may rest safely anywhere on the integral bite block. The eye gel should then be taped down maxilla to maxilla. When inserting the eye gel, it should be remembered that partial resistance and then a feeling of give way may sometimes be felt before the end point resistance is met. This is due to the passage of the bowl of the eye gel through the foreshell pillars. This is quite normal and consistent with correct insertion, but in such cases, insertion needs to continue until definitive resistance is felt. Let's look at some eye gel insertions in real patients. Note the sniffing the morning air position and the gentle press down on the chin. See how there is no need for fingers to be inserted in the mouth. There is never a need to apply excessive force or to repeatedly push down on the device once definitive resistance has been felt. Okay, so that's the eye gel mask. They go on and show some other examples on, on patients, but I think you get the idea. That is an advanced airway if your patient was unconscious or you needed to intubate a patient, the eye gel mask would be an alternative to intubation. Easy IO intraosseous device, this is something we do use. It's very um, predictable. You can get a line on any patient at any time in our clinic if they have a tibia or a humerus. So you can get a line on anybody with this device. And so I like that this is our backup in the, in the case of emergency. 
um, uh, device that lets me know that no matter how hard somebody's veins are, no matter how m much drug abuse has happened, no how, matter how um, much adipose tissue is there, no how, matter how small the veins, we can always get a line in the tibia. Osseous access is as good for us as venous access. And so you'll see the device, it's, a, it's essentially a drill. It has um, needles that go on it. You see the yellow one mounted. Generally, you're going to want the blue one. I like this video. I can identify with this lady. She says, we don't have enough money for a blue one right now. They're 110 bucks a piece, or we use this thing more often, actually. I try to, I try to use this fairly regularly just to make sure I'm, I'm um, fluid with it because we do count on this. Here's a, an example. Those are three needles. We've only got two today because we're on a budget. There's pink for pediatric because all kids like pink. Blue, which is not shown, fits in most adult sites. And then yellow, which works well for the adult humerus and areas of adipose. So you can remember yellow, adipose, you're welcome, enjoy your dinner. It attaches magnetically to the drill. And then once it's drilled into place, you're going to remove that stylet safety first. And then this proprietary dressing fits nicely over the top right there and you can then connect your tubing and you're all ready to go. For the proximal tibia you want to feel two finger breadths below the tibial tuberosity and you're going to go on that anteromedial surface. So you're going to prep the skin of course first. Now with your drill here they're using the yellow one. The blue would also work. Yellow might be a little long so you just don't want to hub it. You're going to advance it through the skin and then drill until you feel give. That's how you know you're in the medullary cavity. Don't push it beyond that because you don't want to go through the medullary cavity. Now you remove the stylet and you can place that fancy beautiful dressing. And now you can hook up your tubing. So they're going to draw off some labs here, which is great for things like H&H &H and type and screen, but some of your elements of your chemistry panel are going to be very different from your serum levels, so you want to be careful. And remember, you can give any medication through an IO line. If you're going to do this in an awake patient, then I recommend using some anesthesia, and you can use my mnemonic 2 of 2 for 2 times 2. That's 2 cc's of 2% lidocaine, over two minutes, then do a flush and wait, and then repeat it, so times two. Two of two for two times two. And that gives your patient 80 milligrams of lidocaine. Some people use a little more, a little less, but that's a safe amount. I also recommend anesthetizing the skin and periosteum before you start. So once that line is in place, you can continue, I mean, you can give anything you want to through that line. Uh, we do anesthetize both the skin as we insert the needle with the 2% plain lidocaine and we also insert as she does lidocaine through the port to anesthetize the medullary bone. Our next device which I hope I don't use is the cricothyronomy kit which is brand name Quick Trick. It has a punch or a sharp large bore needle to penetrate the a ligament into the airway. You aspirate to make sure you're in the airway. Uh, tape it down or use the Velcro that's attached and then you have a an emergency airway if somebody had an obstruction. Let's say they were choking on something. Somebody had uh, anaphylaxis and their, uh, their vocal cords were uh, too tight perhaps or other reason when you just need an emergency airway and you can't intubate a patient. So here is a video showing how to use this quick trick. The kit comes with everything that you need on the inside to actually do the procedure itself. So you're going to tear it open here and you'll see inside of it that it'll have a couple of different pieces here. So you'll have the actual syringe attached to the quick trick, a little plastic device here. This is a stop device and then you'll see that there is a four gauge introducer needle that, that comes pre-inserted into it. And it also comes with an extension, a flexible extension that you'll put on afterwards and we'll show you how to do that. So I'll show you how you do this. This is going to be just like if you're in the field or in the back of the ambulance. So of course the video doesn't show it, but I have proper PPE on, gloves and goggles. Um, so 
imagine I have gloves on. So of course this is our patient that uh, we cannot establish an airway in. So we're going to have some signs or symptoms. We could have air airway occlusion, a swollen tongue, anaphylaxis, um, edema to the mouth, angioedema, or just facial trauma so where you cannot actually get a good mask seal on the patient, whether it's a jaw fracture, mandible fracture, or some kind of a Lefort fracture, but you're just not able to get a proper seal on it and bag appropriately. So of course, you've done all your adjuncts up to this point and there's no, no going around it, we're gonna have to trach this person now. So what you're gonna do is you're going to identify your landmarks. You're gonna have your uh, larynx right here. You'll have the bony larynx there, and below it you'll have the cricoid cartilage below it. So if you can feel there's a small indention in there, a little depression, that's your cricoid membrane, that's where we're going to go. So kind of keep that in mind there. Feel it, palpate it, make sure that's where you want to go because you're about to stick this person in their neck. So of course we're going to splash a little bit of, if you have iodine swabs, use iodine, that's all by all means you can, but at this point we're an emergent tra uh, trach. We're just going to use some alcohol swabs, get it done, okay? So we've swabbed it, we've wiped it down. We've got our kit here. So what we're gonna do, this is the pre-approved manufactured attached um, search procurement device. We're just gonna leave that on it. it makes it easier one-handed, just kind of get it out of the way. So when you insert it, of course the patient's gonna be kind of laying more like this. You'll take the bevel and you're gonna insert the needle at a 90 degree angle straight into the cricoid membrane. You're gonna ins insert it in advance and you're gonna hold the syringe because the syringe is attached to the needle. If you hold down low on the catheter, it's just gonna slide off. So you don't wanna do that. Hold the syringe right at the needle there and you're gonna insert it. Good firm pressure, but also you don't wanna stab this like you're chipping ice because it could go all the way through to the other side and that's bad. So we're gonna advance it very slowly and deliberately until the catheter is below the skin. That's my safety thing there. It's supposed to stay attached until I want it to come off. We'll just reattach. So we're gonna advance it until the catheter is buried beneath the skin there. Once the, it's buried beneath the skin, we're gonna tilt it back to a 45 degree and advance it until the red stop is flush with the skin. This is to help you prevent jamming it through the other side there. So we're gonna, this is a mannequin, so bear with us. The skin on the, the manufacturer will come with a plain air syringe. That doesn't give us a very good indication if I'm in an air pocket or not. So, I mean, I can tell, I, is, there, is, it, is there air coming in here or not? I don't know. So, prior to setup, get a normal 10 cc syringe, flush out 5 cc's, you just need to have a little bit of fluid in there, so you want to see bubbles. This is going to be a very good indicator because when you're in the right place, let's see if I can spin it where it's, if you can see the chamber there, if you're in the right place, you should see bubbles, and that's a very good indicator. So you know now I know I'm in an airway, not an esophagus, not in the soft tissue, or other some kind of thing like that. So we're flush to the skin. We're going to withdraw the needle. Take off the safety cap. Advance all the way till it's flush with the skin. So the needle is gone before you advance it all the way because you don't want to jam that all the way through. So once this is attached like this, you're gonna go through your, now it's gonna treat it like a regular airway. You're gonna hold it, don't let go of it, because if you lose it, you've lost it. Now you've gotta do it all over again. So you're gonna take your handy dandy extension. It's nice and flexible, so it doesn't put any trauma or wiggle the piece while you're bagging them or anything like that. So you're going to fit it on here. If I had an Ambu bag, I'd put my capnography between it, and you're gonna treat, like I said, treat this like a normal ET, like you just dropped a tube in a patient. You need to confirm breath sounds, you need uh, waveform, capnography, color metric, whatever your protocol says, use that. So if it were me, you put your end title on there, put your bag on there, now you're bagging, you're looking for equal chest rise, just like a regular intubated patient now. You're looking for diminished sounds or anything like that, good chest rise, good lung sounds, and wave capnography. And once that is, once you confirm placement, then pass your bag off to your partner or whoever's on the scene that can continue bag. Use the securement device, loop it around, it is Velcro, fish it through the hole here, and now you Velcro it down, and that should be pretty stable. Once you're in here and it's stable like this, I, we, I recommend um, some of the protocol, they put a C-collar on this patient for just more some external stability and kind of help with maintain that neck alignment so the trach doesn't act. Along the same lines of advanced airway is the standard intubation set. I feel very uncomfortable with the idea 
of myself personally trying to intubate a patient. It's not something that's easy to do, even if you're practiced with it and you're an ENT or an anesthesiologist and you do this on a routine basis. But you do need to have the equipment by state law and you do need to be able to answer a few questions on it for sure. If I needed an advanced airway, I'm probably going to use the eye gel. I, th I think that that seems more approachable to me. So the questions that you might be asked is uh, the name of the items. And so you see that the handles there, they have a light source. The uh, straight blades are Miller's. The curved blades are Macintosh. The ET tube is sized using the pinky. So if the patient is big, you use a larger tube. If they're small, you use a smaller tube, but they'll frequently ask, how do you, how do you know what size ET tube to use? I say, well, just match it to the size of their uh, pinky finger. Our uh, kit is located in the bottom drawer. And uh, again, you have to have this by law in Alabama. So if we uh, pull that out, uh, look on the inside, you see tubes over to the left. Here's the handle. Make sure the batteries are working for your inspection. Practice attaching it a time or two. It just snaps right together. Again, that provides the power for the, for the LED light. You um, would sterilize these. If the anesthesiologist is coming in, we'd sterilize these, of course, prior to using it on a patient. These are mostly for emergency. You have another handle down on the bottom right and the uh, curved blades over on the right. So just have that set available for inspection and I believe that will about do it for today. So thank you for listening. This was the sedation cabinet, emergency airway management, as well as the easy IO and of course our obligatory uh, disclaimer. Come out and uh, study with us. We'd be glad to have you.